want to do something, it's not work. Think about the things in life that really are the most work, but don't seem like it because they're so amazing. So you have children. There's no harder work than raising children. But would you have chosen a life without them? I mean, absolutely not. No. What about uh, getting a college degree? What about purchasing your own home? You know, there are all these things that are just monumental. It's like, how am I going to do that? And yet they turn out to be the best things in life. And the great thing about eating this way or really choosing to eat in, in any way other than just going along with the status quo is that it's a one day at a time proposition. You get to make these choices at every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And all you have to do is, is understand the parameters. And the parameters are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. I am your host of the Eat Real to Heal show. I'm Nicolette Richet, the founder of The Green Mustache and of Richer Health Consulting and Richer Health Retreat Center. Now, all of the things we do with all of our companies from The Green Mustache, which has six locations, we're now moving into New York, which is very exciting. Uh, we hope to bring you more details of that soon. And everything we do with the green mustache, with the consulting company, with training physicians and having the wellness center where people come from all over the world. It's all so we can show you the health benefits, the life benefits, the financial benefits, because you optimize your ability to perform in your career, in your workplace. We show you that there's so many benefits to going plant-based. And when you go plant-based, you automatically create an unlimited amount of energy in your body. It's truly unlimited. And I have experienced working with thousands of clients with our health consulting business and reversing their chronic disease. But you know, it's not just about re reversing their chronic disease because ultimately the people want to be free of chronic illness. They want to be free of chronic pain so that they can generate the energy in the body so that they can actually live the life of their dreams. Now, I think in all of my years of teaching this, it's been 22 years of me writing academic papers on uh, plant-based health, on soil quality, on environmental toxicity that affects our health and more. But in all of those years, I have to say that the Game Changers movie is one that you absolutely have to see. It'll blow your mind. It has all of the evidence. It showcases it so acutely, the benefits of turning to a plant-based lifestyle. Now, of course, they talk about doing it for peak performance. There's elements of in there that talk about doing it for the environment and also doing it for your health, of course. And on today's show, we interview Victoria Moran, Main Street Vegan, and she's going to talk about her adventures going plant-based, whole food, unrefined and vegan and how she's done it for ethical reasons, for compassion reasons, for connectivity to our greater world, greater spirit, greater everything in everything that we do and how she's created an absolutely amazing life for herself. So welcome Victoria Moran to the show and please share this podcast with everybody that you know because everybody's going to take away something different from it. So share it with your friends who you think need to hear this message about going plant-based or going vegan or vegetarian, whatever it is, no matter what the reason for doing it, but doing it so that they can optimize their life as well. So Victoria, she has been a Main Street vegan for over 35 years. She holds the title of PETA's Sexiest Vegan Over 50. That's an amazing title to hold alongside the male winner who is Joel Kahn. She's a best-selling author of over 13 books, which include Creating a Charmed Life, The Love Powered Diet, The Good Karma Diet, The Main Street Vegan Academy Cookbook, 
And even her college thesis focuses on compassion, the ultimate ethic and exploration of veganism. So enjoy this podcast as we dive into learning more about Victoria's health coaching business. She's a counselor. She's a corporate spokesperson and inspirational speaker. She is so many things and I'm thrilled to have her on this show. Now, before I dive in as well, I just want to talk about Dr. T. Colin Campbell's Foundation for Health at eCornell, which I took that program this summer as well, and it is amazing. It's at the, through the Center for Nutrition Studies. Victoria's done that program as well. So I encourage anybody out there who's listening, check out their program, sign up for it, um, sign up for Main Street Vegan Academy as well, and learn as much as you can so you can turn your height, your health, and your life around. Hi, Victoria. Thanks so much for being on our Eat Real to Heal podcast. It is a pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, thanks, Nicolette. And so, Victoria, if you could, you know, bring us back because there's not a lot of people that I've had the opportunity in, to interview that have been vegan for 35 years or longer, unless uh -huh. they were just born into that world. So tell me, yes. what was that experience like? What, like, what was happening at the time that um, oh. you did be vegan? Well, it had a long history. I, I had heard the word vegetarian when I was five years old and it kind of stuck with me. So I tried to be vegetarian when I was 13. It lasted four months. I had no idea what to eat, but I do recall that my skin cleared up and <laughs> some things were better, but I got really hungry eating um, cottage cheese and fruit cocktail. But this was very much something that was in my heart. So when I was 17 and got into yoga, and started reading all the yoga books in the library, which at that time, now we're talking, we're going back some, that would have been 1967. Yeah. There were three <sighs> books on yoga in the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, and I read them over and over. And they all said, if you're gonna be serious about yoga, if you're serious about your spiritual path, then you need to be vegetarian. And so I managed to do that as a teenager. I'd never heard of vegan. The term plant-based, of course, was not invented until recently. But when I heard of vegan, it sounded like a wonderful thing, but I thought, that's just so extreme. How could I possibly do that? But then I met Jay Dinshaw, uh, who was the co-founder with his wife, Freya, who is still alive and still doing all this great work, um, of the American Vegan Society, which a lot of people don't know that there is one, mm -hmm. that it was founded in 1960. And, you know, I kind of pause when I think about that, because 1960 was the year that John Kennedy <laughs> was inaugurated president of the United States. It's like, my God, that's that's another era. But this very forward-thinking couple thought that the U.S. and North America needed a, uh, a vegan society. So when I met Jay and Freya, I was told natural hygiene is the other side of being vegan. Because if you want to be a vegan for ethical reasons, you've got to be healthy. And so at that time, how that was coming across was through a philosophy called natural hygiene that had started in the mid 1800s. <coughs> the medical doctors at that time were looking at these awful practices. You know, sometimes we think, oh my goodness, is medicine a little bit off base in some of the things it's doing now? But back then, I mean, they were giving people mercury vapors. They were telling sick people to keep the windows closed in, in their sick room. They were saying, don't eat raw fruits and vegetables, they'll harm you. And, and women were wearing these tight corsets. I mean, just so much was going against people. So these really uh, amazingly insightful physicians it formulated a philosophy that said the body is a self-healing mechanism when given the needs of life and otherwise left alone. And that the needs of life are food in keeping with the anatomy of the species we're talking about. And in terms of the human species, that would be frugivorous because we're most related to the anthropoid apes uh, eating fruits and leaves and shoots and berries and that kind of thing. And um, exercise, sleep, companionship and love, proper relationship with the sun and a life that has meaning. And then if somebody is sick, they suggested going to bed, 
fast and wait, let the body heal. So that was how I was introduced to all of this. And because I was a practicing binge eater at the time, I was not a quick study. It took me several years to get from vegetarian to healthy vegan. But that did happen in 1983, and by then Ronald Reagan was president. I like to do the president thing because it kind of yeah. helps people see what era we're talking about. And my daughter was an infant, and so I went vegan and raised her vegan. And now she is a professional stunt performer and aerialist. She's uh, just started uh, rehearsals with a, a new touring show where she's going to be puppeteering and wearing a 110 pound dinosaur suit and she only weighs 110 pounds herself so are vegans wimpy no no not at all <laughs> i raised one that is an amazing story um especially i love how it connects back to yoga especially um you know which is about unifying it's about yoking together the body mind spirit and i also believe it's about yoking together you know, the connection between us and the planet. We are one, us and nature, we are one. Um, and I really have to applaud you because of the fact that I started teaching yoga um, probably about 18 years ago. And I mean, at the time people thought I was in a cult. So for, I can't even imagine, like literally people would yell out their window and, you know, say, you cultish freak when they saw the yoga really? mat on my backpack. as wow. I do. And I mean, back then there was a few studios in Vancouver. Now we have like hundreds of studios. Yeah. But so I can't even imagine what that was like for you. Um, what was that like for your parents at the time when you? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I will answer that question, but I just wanted to get in a little something about yoga. At that time, when I started, people knew it was weird and they confused it with yogurt, which was also weird. And they weren't sure which was which. It's just both are foreign both are weird and you should probably stay away from them, which of course made me all the more <laughs> attracted uh, to reading and, and learning more. And I, I do wanna tell you that I had the most amazing experience a month ago. I went to London where I lived when I was 18, London, uh, England, and took class for the first time in 51 years from my very first yoga teacher. Her name is Stella Churfus, and she is 94 years of age. She lives in a fourth floor walk up and uh, still teaches a yoga class. It's a senior citizen's chair yoga class, but good Lord, she's 94. 94. <laughs> so yeah, that was very, very cool. So you were asking about my parents. That's a really interesting question. Uh, by the time I went vegan, I was already in, in my early 30s, and so my parents didn't have a lot to say about anything. But they were interesting. My dad was an old-time osteopath. So he went to osteopathic school in the 1930s. Now, that was after osteopathic physicians were able to perform surgery and prescribe medications, as they do now. So they're really interchangeable, MD and, and, and DO. You might go to a hospital and get either one. But osteopathy grew out of a natural healing system uh, a little bit like chiropractic, but a different basic uh, philosophical format. So when my dad went to school, a lot of his training was in traditional osteopathy. And there were some naturopathic underpinnings there as well. So when I was a very small child, I can remember that the back of his business cards had a list of mucus forming foods because he was an ENT, a sinus specialist. And I remember reading these mucus forming foods. Now the first one he said was dairy, which was really interesting to me because I drank milk like crazy. I was a chubby little kid. So as long as it was skim milk, I figured I'm doing something good for myself and my parents were fine with that. But my dad, when he put his doctor hat on, knew that this was a mucus warming food and I had colds and flus and all that stuff all the time. I don't think that was ever uh, put together. Another food that he had on that list was gluten. And I remember, you know, I could hardly read. I was three or four years old. And I thought it said glutton <laughs> and that just eating too much uh, would make you have excess mucosity. Now, my mom was um, 
interested in health. She had struggled with weight in her youth, as had my dad. And I always say that, that being a, a plump child, being raised by parents who converted to healthy living to keep themselves slender was not good. It's sort of like being born into a family where the parents had recently joined some religious cult. <laughs> Oh, it's like, it's one thing to grow up in a tradition and it's another thing to just have found the light. My parents were kind of that way about dieting and calorie counting and all these things that people did back then and I guess some people do now. So uh, my mom was always watching her weight and mine. That was pretty uncomfortable. And um, some of the other stuff, some of the more natural things that I was attracted to. So for example, I had a home birth um, with my daughter. Well, that scared my mother to death. She just thought we were both going to die, even though we were working with a medical doctor and a certified nurse midwife. But my dad, because when he was in osteopathic school back in the day, they all had to do at least one home birth for their obstetrical training, because a lot of people back then were still doing home birth. So it's kind of like everything that goes around comes around. So I'll just finish on that by telling you something that my mom said when she was 86. And she said to me, you know, we used to think that you were crazy doing that yoga and eating those beans. But now people's doctors tell them to do that. Wow. That's an amazing story. Um, and I love that because of the fact that, um, and I didn't realize you were 30. I thought maybe you were like 17 still at that time and you're still living at home and your parents are like, what am I going to make for this kid? Um, yeah, no, that is incredible. My daughter who's 14, she just did her yoga teacher training last year. Wow. It was so, for, well, from my perspective, spectacular. She was definitely the youngest student that um, her teacher Aww. had ever had. Um, and I know it's going to come around right now. She doesn't want to do any yoga at the moment, but, um, which is fine. I know it's going to come around, but she definitely, and she just quit her job at, um, it's, it's one of those popular restaurants that, you know, they tend to be quite popular. I won't mention which one, but um, she quit and she sent me a text. She's like, mom, I gave my two weeks notice. And she's like, I just don't want to eat the crappy food there. And I realized Aww. it. And I was like, that just warmed my heart. And of course I didn't, yeah. I just said, well, you know what, that's your choice and that's all good. So she's back working at our restaurant, which we have a whole chain of plant-based whole food, 100% organic, vegan, gluten-free restaurants wonderful six of them and so but it is one of those things i see all the time where parents are being influenced now by their children mm -hmm. and i think we went through the era just now where i had my kids they're you know 8 12 and 14 and where oh. i was the one making the decisions around plant based eating you know organic food but now i'm starting to see the kids influencing their parents which is really incredible and that's amazing that your parents came around and actually recognized mm -hmm. that that's what's happening in society right now so one of the questions that I have for you, just because you've been in this space for, you know, uh, a beautifully, wonderfully long time um, compared to a lot of people is a lot of my clients, they'll write to me and they'll say, well, I don't know about this kind of eating because now I'm getting obsessed and I'm terrified of the foods that I'm eating. And so, you know, we know about anorexia, we know about bulimia. Now we have an epidemic that, um, and I think it's called orthorexia, where people are afraid of making food decisions because if it's not healthy, then they don't want to eat it. And have you heard about this happening? And I, ha I have, but I wouldn't call it an epidemic. If you get in your car and do a road trip across Canada or across the U.S., you're going to run into long lines at fast food places. If you're in an airport, the big line is the Starbucks. So I don't think orthorexia is an epidemic. I think we hear a lot about it because we're in this world where people are interested in health. So I, I, I don't think it's as problematic as we might think that it is. I think we're just kind of seeing a little bit of a swing from really eating non-food. I mean, I'm of the first generation that was raised on food that isn't even food. You know, we, we heard TV commercials, a better living through chemistry. 
and then we ate the chemicals. <laughs> and you know, some people are still doing that. So I do think that that we can get obsessed, and certain personality types just do that. You know, whatever it is, whether it's a guy that they've met, or a book that they've read, or a philosophy that they've heard about, or a store they found. You know, it's just easy to oh, this is the most wonderful thing ever, and then they kind of of uh, balance out a little bit. I think that we have so much choice in terms of food, particularly people who are middle and, and upper income strata, we can afford to obsess over food. When most people on earth are happy to just get food to eat, and a lot of these people in much simpler cultures are healthier in many ways than we are. So I think that we do need to let go of the small stuff Long time ago, uh, a woman that I knew, I was uh, working for a spiritual organization up in Illinois, and she was one of the speakers who went out on the road giving lectures, and I just thought she was so cool. And everybody there, of course, was vegetarian, and she said to me that when she was on the road, her line in the sand was vegetarian. That was a line she would never cross. But all of these other things about not eating white flour or white rice or cooked oils or other kinds of things like that, she said, when I don't have control over what's going to be on the plate, I just say, body, here it is, deal with it. Because the fact is, you know, we're not going to die because we are having beautiful steamed vegetables at a Chinese restaurant where they only have white rice. And so I think to just kind of be a little easy on some of this stuff can be a really good idea. And that doesn't mean that it's some kind of excuse to uh, say, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to go eat whatever is out there. And, and certainly now there's so much out there, even that's vegan, that if you're really interested in maintaining your health, you probably want to save for really just treats and fun experiences every now and then, but primarily just stick with the basics, with the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and be simple and be healthy and be happy. But yeah, don't worry about being perfect. Nobody's managed that yet. Yeah. And I think this whole concept of orthorexia is interesting because it's again, another opportunity to label something and potentially <laughs> an excuse to not eat you know, real food because it is, or people have the uh, misconception that it is more work. And so what do you say to people that come to you and what's the advice that you give? You've written 13 amazing books. I wish I had been able, I'm going to eventually read them all, but I have definitely been able to read a few and it's been so inspiring. Um, and anybody who, out there who's listening, you have to get your hands on Victoria's books because if you are curious about a vegan lifestyle, about a plant-based lifestyle, dive into Victoria's books because they make it easy um, for you to adopt beautiful lifestyle changes where you can have this you know, version of health and life um, in, in a beautifully articulated way. So what is the advice, Victoria, that you give to people when they say, um, it's so much work? <laughs> well, I think that if you want to do something, it's not work. Think about the things in life that really are the most work, but don't seem like it because they're so amazing. So you have children. There's no harder work than raising children. But would you have chosen a life without them? I mean, absolutely not. No. What about uh, getting a college degree? What about purchasing your own home? You know, there are all these things that are just monumental. It's like, how am I going to do that? And yet they turn out to be the best things in life. And the great thing about eating this way or really choosing to eat in, in any way other than just going along with the status quo is that it's a one day at a time proposition. You get to make these choices at every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And all you have to do is, is understand the parameters. And the parameters are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. And you go from there. So breakfast, gosh, am I going to have a smoothie? Am I going to have some almond milk yogurt and make a parfait out of it with lots of berries and flax ground up and 
walnuts and cinnamon or am I going to have hot oatmeal and warm myself in, in the winter time? Am I going to have some granola, like Engine 2 oil-free granola? I've just mm. discovered that in the past year and just think it's so much fun. I never thought I'd ever have granola again. So you just, you make it an adventure. What is the most delightful adventure that I can do for breakfast today? And then the same thing for all the other meals. And you get some parameters that are easy to stay with. For example, a giant salad every single day. And when I say giant, I am not kidding. In fact, I love uh, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer from True North Health is fond of saying, if you are ever eating a salad and someone doesn't walk by and say, you're not going to eat all that, are you? Your salad isn't big enough. So I get my salad bowls at restaurant supply houses because that's the only place that really has big salad bowls so that you, know, you can do some tossing. And then you want to put in all sorts of wonderful different kinds of things. And then you want to ground that. So often I was uh, touring with, with uh, the film uh, A Prayer for Compassion a couple of weeks ago. Someone in the audience said, but I just feel like I would get hungry if I only ate fruits and vegetables. Well, I would too. That's why when I say salad, I don't just mean lettuce and tomato. We're talking all kinds of wonderful greens and vegetables, and then maybe some steamed broccoli or steamed asparagus, some steamed or, or baked potatoes or, or sweet potatoes or, or winter squash, and, and some nuts or seeds on top for the satiety that that little bit of extra fat provides, and a wonderful dressing you know, made from nuts or based on seasoned rice vinegar, which is an amazing product that you can get in any supermarket in the Asian Asian foods aisle and it's just vinegar but it tastes oily and in a pinch you know it can stand in just with some spices for salad dressing and so you figure this stuff out as you go along you never want to be hungry you always want to eat enough and you don't have to be perfect because if one day you are less perfect than you think you ought to be well guess what you've got another day and you can strive for something better, hopefully not for perfect, because that tends to be disappointing. Exactly. And I love the advice about getting those big stainless steel salad bowls from the kitchen supply store. And usually what I say to people is adjust the shelves in your fridge so that you can just, that one whole shelf takes up that whole bowl. And then it's great. And don't even use salad tongs. Half the time I'm like, wash your hands and just shove your hand in there and like stick it in a bowl or your container to go. Yeah. Um, always have the side of the fridge lined with baked potatoes and baked squash and baked everything. It's really easy. You won't need the sides of your fridge, the door of your fridge for all the condiments because really, mm. I mean, you're just making your own salad dressings as well from whole ingredients. That's really great advice. Now, one of the things um, that you mentioned was potatoes. And how was that for you having eaten this way for your whole life when you saw all the news come out? I'm sure you've seen all the news about everything about food, but you know, a lot of my clients, when I tell them it's okay to eat potatoes, and in fact, we need you to eat a lot of them because it's really a perfect food. They're like, what? I have stopped eating potatoes years ago because everybody told me it was high on the glycemic index. And I'm like, yeah. no. And what was that, what's that been like for you to watch these, you know, really poor science come out and, yeah. and, and really affect people that way? Well, I think that it's, it's kind of mixed science. And, and this is an interesting thing. When we look at the studies that are out there, even the good studies, they're not 100% consistent all the time. And I know that some of our wonderful uh, plant-based doctors that I admire so much, some of them, like Dr. John McDougall, is just like, potatoes! <laughs> no, eat potatoes, eat potatoes. I think the state of Idaho should hire him as their spokesperson. Totally. But some of the other doctors are saying, if you do tend to... Um, you know, blood sugar issues, if there's diabetes in your family, if this is something that you've been working on, you may want to have fewer white Irish potatoes and more sweet potatoes and squash. You work some of these things out with yourself. You know, there are some people who believe in, in biochemical individuality to a degree that they think that some people should be raw food vegans and some people should be doing keto. 
well, that's ridiculous. We're the same species. Totally. But I do think there is some biochemical individuality. So we work with these things and you just kind of see how it goes. In my own life and in my own kitchen, potatoes of every sort, white, Irish, new, yellow fin, it doesn't matter if it's a potato, we probably have every other day or, or every third day because they're so satisfying. And most people find that when you eat them with other foods, this is an important thing too, anything that is a natural food that we want to be eating because of its wonderful nutritional composition and just because it tastes fabulous. So we're talking about things like, like potatoes, like watermelon. Those tend to show up high on the glycemic index, but that's only if you eat them all by themselves. So if you're having your potato with some nice ripe avocado, which works beautifully as butter, if you're having it with steamed broccoli, if you're having it with a big salad and maybe some beans, like one of my favorite potato things is to steam, and I usually steam instead of bake just because I'm impatient, but I'll steam a, a big Irish potato and then I'll mash it a little bit on the inside and I'll top it with chili or with mm. seasoned black beans. Well, that changes that whole nutritional profile so that your glycemic load balances out in a really beautiful way. So personally, I'm not anybody's doctor, but potatoes, cool. Potatoes, cool. I love it. <laughs> Definitely. And with I teach the Gerson therapy to my clients because, and I mean, that's just the therapy I teach. And so my clients have stage four late end stage diseases of all kinds, including cancer, including everything. And um, potatoes are actually consumed a potato for lunch and a potato for dinner. And potato is wow. a main staple in the soup. It's a kidney cleanse soup that stimulates. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So people eat a lot of potatoes and it's just so remarkable to see the color come back into their body. I mean, they're also you know, coming off a standard American diet onto a plant-based whole food, 100% organic, nutrient-dense diet. So of course, they're going to see like immediate rapid changes in, in their skin, their texture of their skin. Um, their texture of their skin actually becomes buttery within like two days. It's amazing Ooh, wow. without any lotions. And so potatoes are a good thing. And I love that you mentioned um, Rip Ezelstein's Engine 2 diet as well, because that is such a great cookbook. It is so many amazing recipes in there. Um, most of the recipes are salt-free as well. Um, they're oil-free. They're incredible. So just in case anybody missed that out there, Engine 2 Diet is a great cook cookbook as well to complement all of Victoria's books as well. Um, now, uh, you also brought up a prayer for compassion, and I just love this. And so is the film completely done? Is it ready? You know, we thought it was. <laughs> Uh, we are actually looking at maybe cutting a little bit before we go into the digital version this fall. Um, the film is from Thomas Wade Jackson, who won a Student Academy Award back in film school for a short that he did called Slow Dancing Down the Aisles of the Quick Check. And he contacted me through my Main Street Vegan podcast three and a half years ago and asked if I would produce his documentary and my first thought is I don't know how to produce a movie but then he said it's going to be about veganism and spirituality and I thought I'll learn how to produce a movie because those are really my combined passions so um, the film is out and it is being shown now um, around the world and anybody who, who wants to see the um, the trailer, you can go to my website, MainStreetVegan.net, and just click on, on film, Prayer for Compassion, and watch the trailer. And if you're interested in hosting a screening in your area, you can be in touch and you can do that, a free public screening for absolutely no charge. Now, we have had some really cool things happening with the film. The, the latest thing is that Jerome Flynn, who, if you watched Game of Thrones, he played the character Bronn, and he's come on as um, a uh, an executive producer for us. So this means that um, we're looking at possibly a tour of India with the film, and really, really getting it out there in a global way, which is so exciting. 
So basically our target audience, although I think anybody would enjoy it and certainly anybody who's eating a, a plant-based diet would enjoy it, but the target audience is people who identify as religious or spiritual. Because what we have seen is that what I think of as vegan ideals really show up in every religious and spiritual tradition around the world. This idea of love, compassion, mercy, reverence for life, they're already there. And yet if you go into any church, synagogue, temple, whatever, and you say, what's, what's your position on? And you could mention anything else that's out there in the news. You could say, you know, uh, female clergy, you could say war, you could say immigration. They're going to tell you where their particular belief system comes down on this thing. But if you say, what's your position on food? They're going to look at you like it's important to feed the hungry. The idea that our food choices matter just isn't in the conversation. Neither are issues of animal rights. And so we want to bring those into the conversation. And that's what A Prayer for Compassion is all about. So I hope some of your listeners will be able to see it, maybe bring it to their cities, and then we will be digital in the fall. Wow, that is incredible. And that's such an incredible feat of you as well to learn how to be a producer. And I just love <laughs> that you're just like, well, I'm going to figure it out. And, um, you know, everything truly is figure outable. So, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that you would take that challenge on as well, uh, given your history um, of going against the status quo for sure. Now, in a prayer for compassion, so I'm I mean, I don't even label myself as anything, not even atheist. I think, you know, everything is possible in this world. And so I don't deny anything. I love to be open to everything. I love all the stories that come out of all the religions. And it's yeah, in fact why I love the Waldorf system, which is where my kids go to school because- Oh, that's exciting. It is so exciting. And because they teach all the religions to the schools and depending, or to the students, mm -hmm. and they really go according to- where the child is developmentally. So when they're young, they're all about angels. So in, you know, the early years they teach about Christianity and, you know, but then they teach about Buddhism and they teach about Muslims and they teach about, you know, they teach all the religions, all the cultures, all the ethnicities. And I mean, not all of them, obviously, but in 12 years, they get a lot of exposure, um, which is so beautiful. Um, and so being somebody who doesn't identify with any particular religion at all, when I saw this film at first, I thought, oh gosh, um, it's, you know, and you did say the audience is someone who does identify, but I actually believe that this film, and which I haven't seen the trailer yet, is going to really be applicable to everybody, but everybody just needs to open themselves up. And the one piece about this film that um, I think just from reading about it that resonates with me is the piece about compassion because of the fact that um, one of my PhD colleagues, she is, um, her research is looking at the communities where slaughterhouses are based. And a lot of times we focus on the animals, but what we forget to remember is that there's humans behind the slaughtering and those people don't get paid very much money. And in those communities as well, the people are, those people who work in the slaughterhouses, those communities have the highest rates of rape, of um, domestic violence and abuse, of alcoholism and drug abuse as well. And you know, and that comes back to our food choices as well. So when we're choosing to eat meat, we're also choosing to say, yeah, it's okay to put people in this environment where they have to slaughter the animals. So it's not even just about the animals. It's about the people who do that and what happens to their brains and their bodies when they're in that day in and day out experience of having to slaughter these animals for human consumption. So that's, an, and I don't know if this film covers that or... Uh, only, only briefly, uh, one of the, the Buddhist uh, people that, that we interview, um, gentleman Bob Isaacson from Dharma Voices for Animals, talks about how in the Buddhist teaching, to slaughter animals incurs a lot of unwholesome karma. But these people who are doing it are usually on the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder. They're taking a job that's the only job there is to take, so guess who else gets some of that karma? 
the people who want the product, who are, who are putting the workers in this situation. I'm fascinated by the study that your colleague is doing. This has been going on for a very long time. There was a book written in 1906 called The Jungle, and it was about the slaughterhouses in Chicago. I read that book maybe five years ago, and it was so relevant. Something called the Humane Slaughter Act in the United States passed in 1925, I believe. So now cows and pigs, but not birds, are stunned prior to slaughter. But all the rest of the horror is there, and certainly what goes on for the workers is there. I visited a slaughterhouse in Missouri some time ago, and I was so surprised leaving and just processing this, this day. I really felt like Dante. I, I had gone through hell, and I fully expected to just have tremendous resentment against everybody there doing these terrible things to animals. And yet I came out with so much compassion for these people who are forced to literally work in a refrigerator. They're standing in blood. They're in the midst of, of horrors all day long uh, for, as you said, very little money. And it's really interesting to me when we think of holistic, you know, that wonderful word that we applied to health. But if you really think about holistic health, Maybe if I'm keto and I'm running and I'm meditating and I'm taking good care of myself, I might have great muscle tone, I might look really good, I might even have pretty good immunity for a while, but I will never be able to say that I have holistic health mm -hmm. because the choices that I'm making are affecting other people and other animals and this planet in an adverse way. So I might look good in my spandex, but that doesn't mean that I'm healthy through and through. Yeah, and I like that concept of thinking about holistic health, not just being your body, but your body in the context of our society, of our economy, of our political system, of our planet, of our stratosphere. I mean, you can go bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it's the same, that's exactly the same picture I try and paint for people when they talk about the dirty dozen and organic food. Um, is that I say, you know, there's the Dirty Dozen, and we've all written about it. I wrote articles about the Dirty Dozen 15 years ago when I, you know, thought that the Dirty Dozen was the way to go. But then it, when I saw myself in the context of the bigger world and that we are all connected, I was like, afterwards, I was like, well, just because you're buying, you know, food that maybe is sprayed, but it has a thicker skin there's still someone on the planet who has to be consumed by those pesticides because they're spraying the food. And eventually those pesticides get into the air and the water and our soil and eventually make their way to us anyway. So, you know, by going with the dirty dozen, then, you know, you're still saying it is okay to pollute the planet and to pollute people somewhere in the world. And when people come to you, because I know this is such a huge controversy when people are wanting to go vegan or go plant-based is they say, well, it's already so expensive. I have to buy all these vegetables. Do it, does it have to be organic? And what do you say to them? I think it completely depends upon a person's willingness, a person's commitment, and a person's budget. What I want most of all is for people to get the animal products out of their diet. This is great for them. This is great for animals. And if we are going to save this planet in the very short amount of time that the climate scientists are telling us we have, we need to eliminate animal agriculture. So there are people, low income, large families, that just adding on organic is more than they could possibly handle. So with them, I, I don't push that at all. I want this to be as easy as possible. But for people who have a little bit more disposable income, it's so important for the very reason that you're talking about. We cannot be healthy on a polluted planet. You know, we, we can't be spiritually healthy when we're expecting somebody else to breathe those fumes for our vegetables. So if we have been blessed with the economic wherewithal to make those kinds of choices, let's do it. And I'm not saying just people who are filthy rich and don't even know what their grocery bill is. 
I'm saying, let's look at the grocery bill. Let's look at what we used to spend on meat and cheese and processed foods and soda and maybe alcohol. That's going to be a chunk of change. And then when we're going to shift over into this other way of eating, the really basic staples are cheap. We've talked about potatoes. Potatoes are so cheap. So cheap. <laughs> you know, but the, the rice, the millet, the, the quinoa, certainly the beans. They're, they're cheap by the pound, and then you cook them, and you get more than you started with. So we've got some really, really low-cost basic staples. And nobody is saying, even if you're doing this organically, that you have to eat goji berries flown in from the Himalayas. I mean, goji berries are full of antioxidants, but so are blueberries that you can grow in your backyard or that you can get the frozen wild blueberries in the freezer case all year round, very, very inexpensively. So you just figure out how you wanna do this. If you're serious about this, there's gonna be a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. And if you will to do this, you're gonna be able to. Exactly. And I love that you touched on the point that um, eating this way, whether it's organic or not, it doesn't have to be expensive because just like you said, I mean, you can buy, and a lot of people are doing this, they're getting together at their schools and they actually do a wholesale bulk buy with the parents at the schools and the teachers get involved and the kids are choosing items, but you can buy a 30 pound bag of oats for about $33. Yeah. Like yeah, we did that you know, back when my daughter was growing up. We're talking about the 1980s and 90s, always involved in food co-ops, um, in uh, farm shares, farmers markets. Just there are all sorts of ways uh, to do this and to make shopping for food an artistic creative kind of experience instead of just one more chore like okay I have to clean the bathroom and go to the supermarket yeah. how about I get to you know pack up the kids in my case pack up the dog and go to the farmer's market and just see what's there I'm always amazed at how many vegetables come in purple that I never knew came in purple oh, yeah. and that's what you learn at the farmer's market yeah, I love that. And it is true. And you have to bring your kids with you. I was exhausted as I was with my three kids going to the grocery store and they're running around and they're chucking things into the cart left, right and center and I'm pulling it out. And it was like literally a marathon at the end of going grocery shopping that at the same time though, it was my kids were exposed to the art of going grocery shopping and, you know, having to have those conversations, you know, why I'm purchasing this and why I will not purchase that and why my hard earned money will not go to buy the stuff in the box or the package. And, um, you know, just discussing, you know, what collard greens are. All the, I mean, it's an educational experience that I think needs to, the art of shopping, grocery shopping needs to be brought into the schools where all the, you know, kids go grocery shopping with the parents, because if they don't get that exposure with the parents, I mean, you know, all all they know a lot of the times are the center aisles that are, have all the processed food. So there is definitely, it, it's not easy when your kids are really little, but it gets easier as long as the kids were exposed to those, to the produce section, then, you know, when they turn 10, 11, 12, and they really are active in being able to make their own meals in the kitchen, then all of a sudden you see them, you know, bring that knowledge through to how they prepare their food as well, which is, which is what's happening in our household right now. And uh -huh. oh my goodness, thank you, because it's making cooking and um, cleaning and eating together even that much more exciting. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, now with talking about kids, um, what is some advice that you have for parents when they want to raise their children um, plant-based, whole food, vegan? What are some right. of the things that um, tips you can give them? I would say, even if you want to think of yourself as plant-based, even if this is entirely a matter of health for you, your kids will respond to vegan because kids respond to animals. Why do we paint little bunnies and lambs on the walls? <laughs> Why do we give them stuffed animals? It's because there's this just amazing connection between children and animals. So if you say to your five-year-old, oh, we're not going to eat that because you don't want to have a heart attack when you're 40. Well, he never thinks he's going to be 40. Exactly. <laughs> and so you, you want to get your children to farmed animal sanctuaries as early as possible so that they can get to know 
that just like maybe the dog or the cat or the hamster that lives as part of the family, these animals are individuals too. They have personalities and they want to live. And that way, you're not going to get any kind of argument from a child who's saying that the other kids are going to McDonald's or they're bringing whatever it is in their lunch because this is saving lives and kids are very moral. We come with a moral compass. It's educated out of us. Mm -hmm. And so the, the children want to be there for the animals. So that's really, really important. If you absolutely cannot get to a farmed animal sanctuary, then even a petting zoo, which as an ethical vegan, I don't really believe in because those animals are gonna go off and be slaughtered when they're no longer babies. But just to make vegans in this world, it's so important for your children to get to know animals. And you can also do a lot online with that. And certainly you don't want to go into the, the horrors of factory farming and slaughterhouses with very small children. But kids are pretty tough and they understand a lot of things and they're going to want to save those animals. So that's the first thing. And then in terms of the health, my philosophy is you don't have to say anything. This is just the way you live. You know, if you were talking to people who were um, Orthodox Jews and raising their children in a kosher household, they're not sitting down and saying, the reason that we are kosher is, it's just, no, this is life. This is what we do. We have these wonderful celebratory Shabbat dinners. This is our life. This is what we do. And so what you want is for your children to see this way of eating as normal. And you can explain as they get older and see what other kids are doing. You know, there's a lot of processed food out there. It's really bad for people. Most people don't realize how bad it is. We just don't have that. And then you decide in your own family how you're gonna work the, the fine points. So when your kid has a birthday party, are you gonna make a very conventional, vegan layer cake that looks and tastes like everybody else's layer cake and has oil and sugar in it. That, you know, if you want to, that's what we did. That's what I did with, with my daughter. And maybe you want to do it a different way. It's entirely up to you. This is your life, your family. But when it's normal, your kids are going to always revert back to normal. Just like a lot of the adults that we talk to, it's so hard for them to mm -hmm. stay on whole foods because the comfort foods, the ones they remember when they were a kid were, you know, the, the TV dinners or the lean cuisine or the, you know, ordering pizza because mom was working, whatever it was. So you want normal for your family to be what's wholesome and what's contributing to health now and on through their lives. Yeah, those are really, really good tips. And um, you reminded me actually of uh, this one time I made a quinoa chocolate cake for my daughter's birthday. And I don't know what happened, but the recipe that I found was not a good recipe, but uh -oh. it tasted delicious, but the whole cake just came out and crumbled and it looked like dirt actually, like this quinoa. So I was like, oh, Awesome. So we made, we layered up these cups with, um, and made almost like a parfait and made it look like it was um, a garden. So we had like a layer underneath and made these little worms out of something and stuck them in there and put a little flower on the top. And the kids loved it. They had no idea they were eating quinoa. But even the worst cakes can actually turn out okay if you have a little bit of creativity added to it too. Oh, that's wonderful. But you also brought up a good point. And one question I want to ask you. So in the world. So I have an environmental background. So that's where I came from before I came into the human health, um, you know, world and before it all connected together. So everything was about the environment, save the planet and climate change and um, GHG emissions. And, but one of the things that we were taught is, um, and especially looking at the psychology of young children, is that you can't hit them with this environmental catastrophe news at too early of an age. Otherwise, it makes them apathetic. Now, it's the same thing for um, showing kids, I imagine, films about slaughterhouses. And what age is too young to show some of these documentaries to these kids? Oh, um, uh, you know, the, the really graphic ones like Earthlings and Dominion, I have not watched. Right. Now, I don't have to because I'm not supporting the industry. <laughs> so yeah. I think anybody who's supporting the industry, any adult, then 
they just to be responsible people should should watch those. I don't think you ever have to show children images like that because everybody knows that we want to live. We want to live as long as we can. And children are not as freaked by death as we think. They see bugs in the yard that have died. If they have you know, pets, especially these really small animals with short lifespans, you know, they pass away, we have the funeral, you know, may, maybe great grandma or somebody will pass away. So they understand this and they understand the idea of wanting to preserve life and, and that animals want to live too. So of course we don't want to do anything that will make them die so that they can't play and be happy. I think it's as simple as that. And then as they get older you know, and become more sophisticated, you can talk about uh, you know, whatever they're interested in. I think follow their lead. You know, We don't need to scare them. We just need to uh, explain, if we even need to explain, I think we explain more in our actions, but just let them know we want to be nice to everybody and we want to be nice to the animals too. And one of the questions that, that kids will have is, yeah, but my teacher, she's good and she eats animals and, and, and grandpa, he's good and he eats animals. And then you get to be a little bit philosophical and you just explain, well, you know, there are some things that we know that they don't know, but you know what's cool? They know some stuff that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So we can listen to them and we can learn from each other. Yeah, I know that's a, the two big pieces as well that you know you're talking about is compassion and being principled as well. And those are two things: is that we have to be compassionate with ourselves, we have to be compassionate with others, um, be compassionate with our children, and with also you know people who haven't potentially learned this information yet, or they have a different philosophy or view. And again, it comes back to being curious. I imagine so. You know, teaching our kids by asking questions you know, as to, and I know that when I've done this, um, if I can remember to do this with my family, which is hard and with my mother, cause my mother's the one that'll be like, what the kids can have sugar. I grew up on sugar or, and she's gotten a lot better, but she'll say what, but it's brown sugar. And I'll be like, mom, brown sugar is still white sugar. And it's hard. Cause it means that every single time you're having conversations about these things, but if we can have those conversations with our mothers and our friends and our family and the kids are watching it, but we have to have those conversations in compassionate ways. Oh, absolutely. And I know I'm guilty of having them in non-compassionate ways at times when I'm just like trying <laughs> to hit that message home. And it's usually with my family, whereas I do have much more um, patience and compassion um, with friends and with strangers than I do my family. So you just reminded me to be a little bit more patient with my immediate family. Um, and the other one is about being principled as well, because you really talk about that. It's just that, you know, this is just the way we are and this is how we live. And so not having to explain ourselves and why we are this way, it's just that we are this way. And I think for me, especially that's one that really hit home about what you said, because I tend to be someone who has to justify it and explain it. And you just actually took this entire weight off my shoulders from Aww. being like, and it's just that, you know what, this is the way I am. I don't have to explain that it's because I've researched it for the last 22 years. I don't have to explain that it's because of health reasons. I don't have to explain that it's because of environmental reasons. I don't have to explain that it's because of social or political reasons or ethical reasons. It just is the way I am. So I have to thank you very much for that. So... Um, and I hope that people who are listening out there, that that's a big takeaway for you as well. So you were, you received the title of um, PETA's Sexiest Vegan Over 50, <laughs> which I think is absolutely so true. There is no doubt about that. Um, you look as young now as you did in pictures that I've seen of you from when you're probably like 25 as well. Um, oh. And I think that's incredible. And when people are, and I know for me, I have to ask you about this. So one of the things, sometimes I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to make my life easier and I'm just going to sell this whole concept as a weight loss program because we live in a society where people are, I want to say vain that, you know, we want to 
look thin. We want to have beautiful skin. I mean, I could often tell the story of when I used to live on score bars and ketchup chips in my teens for about two or three years when I finally had money to spend. So I lived out of a vending machine and my face immediately broke out and I was exhausted and I started to get these constant nosebleeds, but I didn't care about the nosebleeds. I didn't care about being exhausted. I cared about the acne on my face. Um, and so when I switched back to eating, you know, clean whole foods, which is what I had grown up on, all of a sudden my acne cleared up right away. No problem. But every once in a while, I'm just like, I'm, it's an ethical dilemma for me. I'm like, if I actually just sold what I do as weight loss and acne clearing, um, I, and being sexy and having great skin, I would probably be like a millionaire right now. But what are your thoughts on that and how, and how do you go about when you're educating people and um, teaching them from a place of principles and values? Yeah. Well, you're asking um, a big question here uh, with the weight loss. Now, I have a weight loss history. Um, I was uh, either obese or overweight or dieting and miserable until I was 33 years old. I am a compulsive overeater, a food addict, and I identify in the present tense, just like an alcoholic in recovery says I'm an alcoholic, even if he hasn't had a drink in 40 years. So it's a big deal for me. And part of my story is I've eaten this way since 1983. And uh, since 1984, I've kept off just over 60 pounds which I think is very important to say because statistically yes. people that take off 25 pounds or more, it stays gone for uh, only, uh, for only 2% of them does it stay gone for seven years or more. So I think that's an important thing to share. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who have been so beaten up with this weight thing that they are just sick of it. They are done. They are tired of it just keep your words off my body and they are into the body positivity philosophy. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to eat the way I want to eat. And if I happen to be a person of size, that's who I am. Leave me alone. So I feel like I'm walking a very delicate tightrope here because like you say, there are lots and lots of people who would like to not be carrying around excess pounds. And I certainly understand why, you know, at the age that I am now, I'm 69 years old. And I know that for uh, knees, for example, lots of people are dealing with arthritic conditions of the knees. If somebody loses a pound, that's four pounds off the, the knees. If they lose five pounds, that's like 20 pounds less weight on knees that are getting wear and tear arthritis. So this is important. We also know the connections between obesity and lots and lots of degenerative diseases. And yet I think what's really got the power, what's really got the power is this is a way to live brilliantly. Mm. I was staying at a Marriott hotel over the weekend and their new phrase is travel brilliantly. And I thought, I want to live brilliantly. I want to age brilliantly. And I think if we can get across to people, this is a way that a great many people have lost weight and kept it off without suffering. That's certainly part of it. If that's something that interests you, it's there. But even if you're just like, I love my body the way it is, just leave my body alone, you can still come into this way of living that is going to give you so much more joy, so much more energy, and it's going to last. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm looking at 70, and I didn't think that I was going to be feeling like I do, waking up in the morning with all kinds of, woo, you know, what's going to happen today? What can I do to make the world better today? Traveling around. And that's not to say that I don't need more rest than I needed when I was 18. I need more rest. Uh, and I have to take care of myself. And I have to not work out with weights every single day. I have to have that day in between. So there are things, you know, we have to honor the process as the physical body becomes a wonderful vintage. <laughs> instrument. Um, and yet, I think you have to be 
honest with yourself. And I've just met you now, but I can tell that what you're offering people goes so far beyond weight and acne mm -hmm. that the people who are looking for more are going to find you and you can just be filthy rich and still be your beautiful self. Thank you. You're so sweet. And the only reason I brought that up is because it sometimes a lot of people don't realize that, um, especially when they're eating plant based, because you get to eat a lot when you ha eat plant based. You can eat and you don't have to count the calories. You don't have to worry about like, did I have one potato too much, or you know, I need to stay away from the the, the grains and the you know nuts and the seeds. I mean, definitely to the extent that maybe some people are doing it now, where they have nuts and seeds for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and for every snack in between, but they're not yeah. eating the vegetables and the fruits in between. Um, and so, you know, maybe turning the nuts and seeds into a garnish instead of the main meal is potentially a, a healthy and sustainable way to go. But, you know, I had to talk about the weight. And I think the biggest point that you did bring up is the fact that it's true. When a lot of people go onto these diets, as opposed to making, you know, plant-based eating um, or vegan eating a way of life, then you know, I, I think it's like 1% of people will keep the weight off for a year. And then what happens is at a year, most people, 99% of people will even gain more weight back than they lost. And that's so disheartening for them. I mean, it contributes and further exacerbates, you know, the mental health, um, you know, perspective that goes along with that as well. And I mean, I don't know if we're in a place where everybody can just love their body as, it is designed to be. Um, but I know one thing that everybody can fall in love with. It is what you said. It's about living brilliantly. And what would that be like for the world if everybody just lived brilliantly? Uh -huh. <laughs> what would the world look like if people were literally shining their you know, maximum potential of energy that they can have in their body? And um, you know, and if we did that, this world really, we would have the energy to go out there and pursue the social issues that we have, the artistic goals that we have, the travel goals that we have, the career goals that we have, or just even loving our family fully. I remember a guy in one of my retreats and I said, what would you do if you had unlimited energy? Just unlimited energy. What would you do with that energy? And it was a writing exercise and he started to cry and he said, you know, I would play with my kids. I'd have the energy to play with my kids. And some people don't even have that energy, let alone thinking about the energy that they have for their career as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so living brilliantly is something that we can all do when we eat food that does fuel our body. Now, another piece that I have to ask you about, because you are 60, 69, I mean, you're gorgeous, you're stunning, you're brilliant, You, yeah, I can hear the energy in your voice as well. Um, a lot of my clients who come to me, they often at 69 or even less, 55, they're like, oh yeah, you know, as I've been aging, I don't need to eat as much food. And so just a banana and a yogurt is what I'll have for dinner. And let's talk about that because there's this conception out there. There's this belief that as you age, you eat less. And is that something that you are familiar with or what can you say to that? Well, the general consensus, the general uh, teaching is that when you get older, you need somewhat fewer calories, not that much fewer, just because most people aren't moving as much, although there are uh, like 84-year-old uh, triathlete Ruth Heydrich, a PhD, comes to mind. So yeah. she's burning plenty of calories. Um, and you know that, that people's lives tend to become a little bit smaller and quieter and more well, closer to home, let's say. And in one way, that's really beautiful. That, that is, is certainly one way to age gracefully in this world, but it's not the only way. And the wonderful thing about being alive in the 21st century is that we get to choose if that's how we want to do it, or if we want to do it running marathons like Ruth Heydrich. So um, I think that your caloric needs uh, depend on who you are. And basically, I don't even think about caloric needs. As far as I can tell, I eat the same amount now as I ate 35 years ago when I first started on this path and was losing the weight. And 
if I happen to be eating a little less because I'm older, I don't even know that. I know my weight stays the same, so whatever it is, is working. So I think we tend to get so complicated. And I also think that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And most of us, particularly women, have read a lot about nutrition, but we've read about it in women's magazines and, and websites. And we're not really educated about the science. We just have a lot of information that's very easy to misapply. So I think that we need to go back to how did nature intend that our species would know what we were supposed to eat? We're very attracted to colors. And so these wonderful plant chemicals, the phytochemicals, the antioxidants, different ones come in produce of different colors, spices of different colors and flavors and scents. And if at whatever age, you have a diet that looks like the rainbow, or as I tell people, your shopping cart and your plate will ideally look like a Christmas tree, which is mostly green with splashes of other bright colors. If you're doing that, if you're using the wonderful spices, if you're eating a variety of natural plant foods, you're acing it and your, your weight and all the rest is going to take care of itself. You know, and that's, um, yeah, a really good way of putting it too, is that um, this buying into that, any misconception or any amount of information, you know, that, oh, it's okay to eat less. And I've had doctors who've told my clients that like, you're eating less because you're aging. And I know that when um, my clients switch to this lifestyle of eating the Christmas tree diet, we'll call it, where it's lots of green sprinkled with all of these beautiful colors that all of a sudden it's amazing. They become, it's like they've been starved, they've famished. And all of a sudden as their digestion picks up and the peristalsis action in their colon and their intestinal tract picks up and starts moving things through faster, all of a sudden they become hungry. And then they can, they actually go back. It takes about two months, but they actually go back to eating beautiful big salads with the potatoes and eating like they did again when they were like 25, 35 years old. And, you know, and they're again, losing the weight, the weight comes off, their knees get better. Um, my mom just did this where she was supposed to have knee transplant surgery. She decided to do this, switch her diet. Oh. She does it in five weeks. She um, went back and she was able to actually hike up the hill to her oh. MRI appointment, oh. which it was amazing. And then they gave her the second MRI follow-up before they were supposed to schedule her for her knee surgery. And they're like, uh, we don't need to give you knee surgery. And so they just canceled it. And so now she's like, she went hiking all over. She just went to Portugal and she went hiking all over Portugal oh. and all over Africa. Um, and you know, like it's true, like what you're saying is true. When we lose a few pounds, when we eat this way, we actually start to rebuild our body. And you know, that my mom's a prime example of how that happened. And you could, you know, maybe it's not you know, never getting the knee surgery, but you can definitely delay it and feel good at the same time, which is pretty yeah. awesome. And I wasn't implying that as we get older or really at any time that we're supposed to increase our calories or oh, no. um, more calories than we need because we know in terms of life extension, the magical formula is the most nutrition for the optimal weight maintenance amount of calories is what we want to do. So one of the reasons that most plant-based physicians recommend not consuming oil or consuming very little of it is because it's very, very concentrated in calories for almost no nutritional value. And that way it's a little bit like sugar. And so this doesn't mean that you're never going to go to a restaurant where they roast their vegetables in olive oil. You know, we're going to do that. But generally speaking, we don't want to have a great concentrated amount of calories that don't come with the nutrition. And what's so great about fruits and vegetables and beans and spices is that for very few calories, you get so much nutrition. So you can really eat until you're full, until you're satisfied. And then you go out and enjoy living between meals. This has certainly been one of my mantras for a very long time, something that, that helped me a lot uh, when I was losing weight and in those uh, early years when I was paying some attention to maintaining it, which now I don't 
pay attention uh, anymore. But it was the idea of living in between meals. You know, there's a time to eat and there's a time to live. And I think that in my case, and maybe a lot of people who identify as compulsive eaters or food addicts, the reason that food became problematic is that we weren't real good at knowing how to live in between meals. And so we had to keep eating, <laughs> but yeah. just really finding the, the great joy in life. And I think right now, you know, some people are so discouraged by the state of the planet and the environment and oh my gosh, there's probably not any hope. Well, you know what? I'm not going to go down without a fight. And just that alone is an energizing way of looking at life. No, definitely it is. And yeah, I'm not going to go down without a fight. And I think that for a lot of people out there, they don't want to go down without a fight either, but they just don't even have the energy. And that's where the apathy comes from. It's that connection to the foods that they're eating that are really just robbing their energy. It's not fueling them. And so going back to living brilliantly is that, you know, and try this, like try what Victoria is saying, like try it for, I don't know, two months. What do you usually recommend to people? You say two one, weeks, one, two months to no, just try I'm, eating plant based? I say one day. And one I'll tell day. you why. That's because I have a 12 step background. Um, Overeaters Anonymous was very instrumental in my uh, recovery from my eating disorder. And taken from the old AA philosophy of you just don't pick up the bottle one day at a time, this makes it so doable. Because if we're thinking about Oh my gosh, what, what about my sister's wedding in, in yeah. October? What about my trip to Argentina next summer? <laughs> what am I going to eat then? And then we get so involved with the future. So the only thing you can do, the only day you've got to live, the only moment you have to live is this one. The only meals you have to eat are today's meals. So today, we're going to eat the very best we can. We're going to make the best choice from what's available. And that's going to vary from day to day because some days you're going to be going to the farmer's market. Some days you're going to be at home with a brand new grocery delivery and you're going to be able to make those soups and those potatoes and the salads like you talked about. And it's going to be perfect. Another day you're going to be out on some highway doing a long road trip and your choices are going to be, what is the very best thing I can get at either the Burger King, the Wendy's, or the Taco Bell? So your choices aren't going to be great. But even in those places, you make the very best choice from what's available. And you have your line that you will never cross, just like my vegetarian friend from long ago. For me, the line that I will never cross is animal products. That's my line in the sand. Your line might be somewhere else. Maybe it's further than mine. Maybe it's not as far as mine. But you've got your line you will never cross. And then beyond that, you're going to make the best choice from what's available. And this is such a magical way to live because you get practice with the food. Because we eat really often. Most people eat at least three meals a day. Some people eat more than that. That's a lot of chance to practice making the best choice from what's available. And then you find that you start making the best choice in to-do lists. You make the best choice in people to date. <laughs> you make the best choice in just everything in your life. And what happens is you not only end up with a healthier body, but with a more, as we're saying, brilliant life. No, that's really well said. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I was actually, and I should have put two and two together, but I was wanting to find someone who had um, gone to a, a group to support them with their food addictions. And then I always hesitate too, because I know there's some people, you know, who have gone to AA, they are, or NA, uh, Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, where they're like, oh yeah, no, food addiction does not compare to alcohol addiction or drug addiction, where, I don't know, I have met enough people now to believe that a food addiction is just as powerful and it has just as strong a grip as alcohol or narcotics. And especially when we're talking about food that is smothered in refined sugar, refined oil, refined salt, like it is hard for our brains yeah. to, like it is an addiction. So when people say, oh, it's not the same thing, don't talk about food addiction that way, I'm like, actually, I disagree. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think what you're saying is, is we are really addicted to 
processed foods to, to sugar, salt, fat, although certainly a compulsive eater in a pinch can binge on just about anything. But when I used to binge, my very last choices was uh, raw vegetables. That was the last thing I'd binge on. Although I could, if I was trying to be on a diet that I still psychologically needed to overeat, I could just slather a lot of mustard on cabbage leaves and <laughs> just stuff right. my face that way. And then fruit was kind of second. It's like, I didn't really want to eat a bunch of fruit. It's so watery. You know, if you're looking to get a fix from food, you want it from concentrated food. You yeah. want it from a peanut butter and, and jelly or honey on a big thick piece of bread. You want it from um, a trail mix, you know, all, all mixed together. So you've got the sweet and, and the fatty and, and you can just get all those calories in a really short amount of time. Or certainly you want it from processed foods and, you know, ice cream and Twinkies and all that kind of thing. So it's definitely an addiction. Anybody who has had it knows that. Um, I, I will say that Overeaters Anonymous, OA.org, Save My Life. That's a completely nonprofit organization, doesn't cost anything. Um, it's really, really great. There's another group called Food Addicts uh, Anonymous that I steer people away from because they don't like people being vegan. They, for some reason, they get into the food. OA, if you're in, in a, a good group doing things the way they're supposed to, doesn't talk about the food at all. Your food is up to you, your doctor, your nutritionist. That's your business. What OA is about is the 12 steps that come from Alcoholics Anonymous, changing from the inside out so that you become the kind of person who doesn't have to eat for a fix. So in my personal life, I had been trying to be vegan ever since I went vegetarian. So, and that was about 12 years before this finally happened that I, I was able to do the whole thing. And it was only when I really surrendered to this 12 step process, which is a day at a time, living in a way that's kind to myself and others, that I was finally able to be vegan. I couldn't even do that before I had the recovery process going on in my life. That's just my story. Everybody comes from a different place and they find their way in the way that they find it. But for me, the combination of this inner recovery through a 12-step program and then eating a whole foods plant-based diet has been the absolute answer for me for a day at a time for 35 years and counting. That is amazing. And I'm so glad that um, you were able to bring light to that because definitely I wanted to have a whole show just on um, overeating um, addiction to food. And so now for someone to, how would somebody know that they're addicted to food? How would somebody know uh -huh. that they should call OA.org? Yeah. Yeah, there is a, a questionnaire if, if you go to the uh, OA website, but basically you already know. It's like anything else. Whenever you get these thoughts of, hmm, that guy has really not been treating me well. Do we think maybe he's not my soulmate? Duh, he's not your soulmate or he'd treat you well. <laughs> and if you're thinking, I wonder if all this trouble that I've had with eating for all these years, I wonder if the reason that if I have Oreos in the house, I eat the whole bag. I wonder if that means something. You know what? If you're even thinking it, it probably means something. But you certainly uh, can take the, the quiz. It asks questions like, do you eat normally in front of other people and then wait until you're alone um, to eat in private? Um, have you ever been uh, medically treated for your weight? Have you ever lost weight but then not been able to keep it off? And these are all you know, mm. kinds of indicators, not necessarily that you're a food addict, because it could also be that you're just a regular person who didn't know that the foods out there in the supermarket, all of those packaged and processed and salted and fatted up foods are, are just a problem for anybody who's normal. In fact, I have said to people in, in private practice that if you're thin, but you're going to fast food restaurants and you're eating the standard North American diet, maybe you need to see a physician 
because yeah. this is a diet designed to make people obese. It's a diet designed to make people hungry and unsatisfied so they'll keep going back through that drive through or so they'll keep going down those aisles and buying more of those foods. And so, I mean, the fact that most people are overweight is not surprising and it's not their fault. We're eating food that's designed to create that. But if you also have this little extra thing going on, if you eat to assuage feelings, if the boss was unkind to you and then you come home and finish off the haagen dazs if you just feel tired, but instead of taking a nap, you feel like you're supposed to go to Starbucks and get a frappuccino, you know, this is kind of using food in ways that it's not supposed to be used. And so maybe that extra help from a 12-step program would be just the answer for you. It certainly was for me. Oh, that is amazing information. And I say Thank you. was and is because, yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still part of that because, um, you know, when we have answers to something, we don't want to abandon the people who need those answers. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, I can't even imagine, you know, how hard it is because I think about myself where, you know, like I will have a bag of vegan, gluten-free, organic potato chips, you know, and, you know, and it is one of those things that I definitely know that it's usually about once a month that I'll crave them. So I know that there's something in there that I'm like, what is it? I'm so curious about it. But I, sometimes if they're in the house, I will not resist them. Like if my husband brings home a bag, I will not resist them. Um, and it's really, really tough. But I mean, I know how strong those food addictions are just based on McDonald's. Because I remember when I first got my driver's license and we would leave school with our friends, pack the car, five of us in the car, go to McDonald's and we would have a Big Mac. And this is way before I knew anything about the environment way before I knew anything about, you know, food as medicine, um, about the ethical side of meat production. Um, I pretty much was this like rebellious teenager. And, you know, and to this day, when I see the yellow arches, I can't stand the smell of it. I can't stand, I would never eat McDonald's now. I mean, my kids never have had it, but I still contemplate it. I go, Hmm. And I just, it's the, it's the memory of being with my friends and being 16 and driving my car for the first time and the excitement and sitting in the parking lot and listening to Elton John. And, you know, sometimes the rain would be like, I can picture all of that. And so there is an attachment to McDonald's, you know, psychologically. Um, and I also just gave up drinking as well um, entirely. And it was because of very similar things that you said, I would, if it was a hard day, I'd be like, oh yeah, my husband would pour a glass of wine and I'd be like, oh yeah, I'll have one too. I didn't want the glass of wine. I actually don't enjoy drinking. I don't even like the taste of it. But too often, and it, for me, it was like four glasses a week, which some people would say, oh, that's nothing. But for me, it was a lot because of the fact I wasn't having it for the right reasons. I don't even know if there are right reasons, but it was because I would do it in times when I was exhausted, stressed, and I didn't want to be that person anymore. So I'm doing... I can't remember his name, but he has this program called One Year No Beer. And I, I thought, love him. Yeah, yes. I know him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, he's, he's been on my podcast. We've had lunch together in, in London. Oh, great and guy. His, he is such a great guy. And his podcast um, that I listened to, which I'm going to listen to the one you did with him as well, that I loved it because if you substituted out refined, packaged, uh, processed food for alcohol – there were so many similarities between alcohol and food and it just, and it just lit up my life. Like I really, and it really, and I love the angle that he comes from because it's the same angle that you come from as well. It's, it's hard to recognize your brilliance when it's under the veil of processed food or alcohol or exactly. drugs. There's right? another uh, wonderful book, uh, same thing. Th these are people who are not necessarily alcoholic. These are just regular people totally. who just think their lives would be better if they didn't drink. So there's a woman named Ruby Warrington who wrote a book called Sober Curious. And she's English. So I listened to her book on audio because I love listening to people with English accents. Me too. But it's, it's just enchanting how she had a, a very similar uh, trajectory on that. And, and by sober curious, she means that she leaves the door open that maybe at some point if she's at a wedding and her best friend wants a champagne toast, 
that she would participate in that, but that for the most part, she is a person who does not consume alcohol. And I really think that that is the wave of the future because people used to drink a lot more than they do now, certainly in, in this country. I mean, I remember when I was a little girl and, and all the names of the cocktails <laughs> that you know my, my parents were very aware of and, and participated in, even though neither was a heavy drinker. And that's something that a lot of people have grown away from. Uh, one of the wonderful activities happening in the world that I find really exciting is that three years ago, hip hop added a 10th element called hip hop is green. And the pillars of hip hop is green, if I can remember all of them, I can remember most of them at least, are a plant-based diet, food justice, organic gardening, animal rights, I'm forgetting one, and sobriety. And I love that they put sobriety in there because like you say, and certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not like uh, the old anti-drinking woman that would go to all the saloons in Kansas and with her hatchet and <laughs> tear them down. It's none of my business what other people eat or drink, but just living sober as well as with all these amazing foods and superfoods it's just so much fun. Why would anybody want to dampen that down? Totally. I 100% agree with you on that. And that's why I'm in this experiment right now with myself just around alcohol. It's been about a month and a half. And oh my God, I'm in love. Like I'm actually in love with myself, which is something I probably, you know, like everybody else has struggled with um, to, to really, truly love yourself. And, you know, I thought I was pretty, I thought I was pretty good. I was doing well. And, you know, I had the food thing pretty covered and felt amazing about that, but I just didn't realize I could even feel more incredible and more amazing and more light, you know, yeah. and that comes back to that brilliance as well, is that, um, and also just more patient. That's another thing I've realized. I've been more patient with my children, more patient with myself, more compassionate even um, by cutting out the alcohol. And it's just been this really exciting experiment. And it's been a year and a half, I mean, a month and a half. And at first I thought I would be, you know, it was the same thing. I was like, just one day. I'm just going to do one day. And then it became a month. And now I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to keep going and see where it takes me. Who knows? It might be for the rest of my life and it might be for a year. It might be. But journaling was one of the big things that I found really helped me. I'm not a big journaler at all. I don't write a lot. Um, and that just by writing out how I was feeling in that moment when I wanted the alcohol was actually really helpful. So if anybody's listening to this and, you know, there's probably, and I'm sure in, um, in OA, Overeaters Anonymous, in the 12-step program, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's so many great tips for people when they're in that moment and they are struggling and they want to lean towards alcohol or lean towards their food. I'm sure there's so many incredible um, tools, but for me, I know well, journaling helped. That journaling is great. That also was very helpful in my process, but if I may, I would just like to tell your listeners a little story, a little oh, fable. Uh, I, this is in my book, uh, The Love Powered Diet, which is about recovery from uh, food addiction. But I think a really important thing to do when you're having a craving is to be able to sit with the feelings. So here's the story, once upon a time. There was a woman whose house was beset by demons and she would go into the village and she would drag the parish priest out at all hours of the night and say, Father, you have to come to my house. You have to do an exorcism. So he would do it and things would be fine for a few days. But sure enough, the demons would come back and she would be going into the village and bothering him yet again. And finally, after several months of this, he said, Madam, your problem is so severe that no mere exorcism will work. You need the holy stool. So he pulled the simple wooden hassock out of his closet and he said, I want you to take this home and when the demons come, put the stool in the middle of the floor and sit on it. Well, the woman did not like that one bit. She wanted an exorcism, but you know, it was what she had. So she took the stool home and that night 
the demons came in greater numbers than they had ever come before. And she was scared to death, but she put that stool in the middle of her living room. She sat on it. And sure enough, they started to leave. And before very long, they were all gone. So she wasn't quite sure she had the right answer. But the next night when they came back, she got the stool out again and the same thing happened. And she also noticed there were fewer demons than before. And this was happening night after night. And then she noticed several nights they didn't come at all. And eventually, she was almost never bothered by her demons, but she held on to that footstool and that poor priest missed it for the rest of his life. <laughs> so the, the moral of the story is you sit with uncomfortable feelings. You don't hit send on an email. You don't call somebody and yell at them. You don't grab something to eat, drink, or chew. You sit. And the same thing with cravings. You just be with them. Cravings always run themselves out. Nobody has ever died or gone crazy because they wanted a Snickers bar. It's just never been documented that that happened. Cravings are not fatal and they do go away. And this becomes a pattern. You're creating new neuro transmitters in your brain so that always before it's I'm hurt I'm scared I'm sad I'm sleepy I'm going to eat or drink or whatever it is but then you start creating this this neural pattern that is all these things happen and they do and they will because that's life and I'm just going to be with it and maybe I'll meditate maybe I'll take a walk maybe I'll take a bath maybe I'll listen to some wonderful music but as I'm just there with the feelings, with the cravings, they will go away. Mm -hmm. And that is, in a nutshell, the way out of addiction. That is just a very powerful story. That footstool, I mean, and that footstool can be anything, right? It could be your chair in your house. It could be your seat in the car. It could literally be uh, that, uh, yeah, that but still can be everywhere with you at all times. Yeah, you can just stop and sit. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's knowing, you know, the idea of, okay, I'm sitting on the magical stool now is, you know what? This embarrassment happened. This hurt happened. This yeah. disappointment happened. This craving is in me, but I'm on the magical stool now. <laughs> yeah. And, and just being with all that stuff, it, it does, um, run its course and, and dissipate, you're stronger than it is. And that, that power within you for people that do have a spiritual connection, it's, it's a very, the, the great beneficence that breathed forth this planet is more powerful than whatever the food is that you might be craving right now. Wow. That is a brilliant way to wrap up this podcast. Um, I know I have a gazillion, gazillion questions for you and um, so many insights that I would just love to glean from you. And I'm sure our listeners do as well. So they can refer to anybody who's listening, please refer to the Vegan Academy, um, which I know you have an appointment that you need to rush off to, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yes. not, not quite rush, but it is Main Street Vegan Academy. Yes. So it's Main, Main Street Vegan Vegan, that is my trademark name. Um, some other people are out there calling themselves Vegan Academy. So yeah, MainStreetVegan.net is all the information about the Academy, which trains vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So this is for people who are already vegan uh, to come to New York for a magical week and get certified with a, an incredible faculty and really fun field trips. And then you leave as a vegan lifestyle coach and educator and all the information is there as well about the Main Street Vegan podcast, the Main Street Vegan blog, and Main Street Vegan productions with our first documentary, A Prayer for Compassion. 
Incredible. Thank you for all of that information. We definitely want to do a screening of a prayer for compassion cool. in Whistler. So I'm going to, my team, great. Will, yes, my team will follow up with you. We've always had a great turnout to the movie screenings that we have up here. Um, I think there's just, Canada is a little bit different than the States. We're actually a little bit behind, which um, when it comes to all things, plant-based, whole food, vegan, everything, you have many more societies and organizations and beautiful people like yourself. It's happening in Canada, but we are, I'd say, a good decade behind you. Well, so, we have we have lots of trading back and forth to do because you guys are certainly ahead of us with nonviolence and taking care of people true. well. So true. Uh, yeah. we've all we've all figured some things out. It's kind of like in in personal life. This is why it's so great to have all different friends of different ages and different ways of seeing the world because we can learn so much from one another. Exactly, exactly, I agree. So we'll have that movie screening up here, so we'll be in touch with you. And thank you so much for being on our show. I hope to stay connected and to do this again um, one day soon. Let's do. Thank you so very much for having me. Amazing. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed that podcast with Victoria Moran. What a pleasure it was to have her on the show. And please, like we said, check out all the offerings she has, get a hold of her cookbooks, check into her academy, register, learn as much as you can about plant-based, whole food, unrefined eating. You can do this starting today and you can turn your health and your life around. And that's ultimately what we want for everybody out there because it's not only good for you, but it's good for the environment. It's good for climate change. It's good for the animals. It's good for the soil. Check out Dr. Zach Bush's podcast on the Ritual Podcast. We love all the work these people are doing. And what you'll see is that every time you reach out for a new resource, it'll just teach you more and more and more about the things that you may not hold already know or it'll confirm the things that you do already know the stuff that you've heard before and it'll allow you to step into action so that you can get results so i hope you enjoyed this podcast share it with your friends and family start getting them healthy alongside you so that you all have the energy that you need to do to accomplish the life of your dreams stay tuned for our next podcast coming up next week and thanks for being with us. Eat well, do well.